something special at the end for those who stay all the way in the end. And I'll, I'll shut up when that's about to happen. So, um, thank you for your response to that. Uh, any questions? Any uh, comments? I mean, I love to tell you what, I'm sitting with horror icons, and, and they're loving me. So that's really cool. Anybody have any questions or concerns? <laughs> Other than the gentleman that fell down upstairs, he's okay, by the way. They say in 10 or 15 years, he may be able to see again. I'm kidding. It's my sense of humor. You just saw it. He's okay. Uh, any questions? Comments? We got thumbs up. Okay, did you enjoy yourselves? Yeah. Good. My big, my big thing is, did you, did you feel bad when R.A. died? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Did you feel bad when Malcolm died? Yeah. There was. A, I mean, it's, it's to me. In a lot of horror films, what what is missed is caring that the people get killed. I think they were killed in some pretty unique ways, right? Okay. But it, the fact that you cared about them when they died is important to me. Because uh, I like to think that people care when friends of theirs get skewered in a 1973 Winnebago on a tent pole. I think, you know, because that happens fairly frequently. And uh, I like to think that people, people care about that. So, come on up here. Come, on, come up here, you, and moderate. Moderate all these, this litany of questions. Now there's something, uh, I don't know how long it takes. I guess longer than that. Uh, there's a group by the, by the name of the Dance Hall Pimps. And that's who you're hearing right now. This song was written for Smothered. There's a bunch of songs in there that, uh, that were perfect for this film that I actually heard before I wrote the script. Which is a little strange, isn't it? That's an amazing soundtrack. We're talking about the early things. Amazing. I'm so glad you liked it. Uh, yeah, this is called the Dance Hall Pimps. If you uh, if go online, you can listen to a bunch of their music. It's not all this this kind of music, but there is a whole album. Uh, I think it's called Underneath Your Stone, which is the first song you hear in the movie, uh, and that's the Dance Hall Pimps. And oddly enough, when my daughter got a scholarship to SCAD in Georgia. I bought her a Scion, and the uh, head of the parts department in Marina Del Rey is the bass player for the Dance Hall Pimps. That's how I happened upon this particular group. Oh wait, turn it up, turn the lights down, turn it up. It's like the end of, uh, of the, the, the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, <laughs> only better. Well, there's Richard. He was the first man to put on the mat. Look, here we go. Big Sister Agnes said I could only leave one witness behind. Never said anything about tossing my collection out. That bastard said, my sweet Malcolm, asshole Carl, funny Bill, poor Thelma, darling R.A., and movie star Kane won't be needing this shit anymore. And hopefully I won't be needing these babies. I want to sell them on eBay. <laughs> okay. That was the last little, uh, last little dig. Um, so there we have it. Please moderate this motley group. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Are we doing a Q&A? you want to do a Q&A? Or how do you want to do it? Sure. Oh, okay. yeah. I can run down and do it. Uh, no, so I don't know if anybody has uh, any questions. I'll you stop. I think I have questions. Oh, wait, yes. I like the uh, cage. You're good. B e a u x d o o k e. That's fantastic. Thank you for catching that. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I love the Dukes of Hazard, but I'm. I'm trying with every, every heartbeat and every breath in my soul, to make people say, "Oh my gosh, you're the guy that did Smothered and and all these other movies," and oh yeah, you were on the Dukes of Hazard, rather than. Yeah, Bo Duke, your name is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's been nearly 40 years <laughs> of that. And I love the Dukes of Hazzard. And I love Zero One. I mean, the number one, if I was on Sesame Street, I would be the number zero one. Okay? But 
you know, there's a lot of other things involved, and uh, I, I love it when, uh, when people notice things like that. And the cast of Smothered, when they saw that sign, they said, really? Because I first met Kane, he, was, he played a ninja on Dukes Go to Hollywood in 1984, I think it was, right after the, his accident where he got burned. So uh, I've known Kane for a long, long time, and we share a birthday, oddly enough. We're April 8th, which really, oddly enough, is the day that Richard, who was the first man to put on the mask, died. Yeah. In heart. And Richard was supposed to be Kane's part in this movie, but sadly, uh, dead people don't show up to make a movie. So, uh, so he didn't, which is why, and I, I, I put it up to them, I said, you are horror icons, you knew Richard, give me a salute to the dead. And that's where they came up with this. <laughs> that's where they came up with that. Yeah, they came, I, I had nothing to do with that. That was all on them. Anybody? Yes? We filmed Smothered in 18 days. Wow. 18 days, that was it. All in Louisiana, and uh, I would say 90% at the place that became John Schneider Studios later. Uh, that was actually a camp called Camp Singing Waters that someone was trying to, to sell me for about a year. You gotta see this place, you gotta, you're gonna love this place. And I'm like, I don't know. And uh, when I saw it, I saw Area 13, Area 51, the, the most unique thing about Camp Singing Waters is it actually had a hill because there are no hills in Louisiana. And uh, when I saw it, I fell in love with it. And uh, about a year after we filmed Smallville, I'm sorry, Smallville, wow, <laughs> smothered, uh, I wound up buying the place and now it's John Schneider Studios. We've shot, well, there were six movies shot last, seven movies shot there last year, uh, six of which I had nothing to do with, and one of which Alicia uh, hired me to be in. She's up there. Uh, and then we did we did three movies there this year, and one more in. We're going to do one more in December. So it's a, it truly for me is a is a magical place. It's right outside of Baton Rouge. It's in a little town called Holden, Louisiana, in between Baton Rouge and Hammond on uh, the 12 Interstate 12. I love it. Yes. Have you thought about doing uh, shows with Rob Zombie? Stuff with Rob Zombie. Yeah, yes. well, I'm hoping that uh, maybe Rob will see this and go, I think there's a brother from another mother. Make it wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it would be fun. Yes. Uh, because Rob did, uh, that's where Bill came from, Devil's Rejects and uh, Otis, yes. Otis uh, Driftwood, yep. right? That's why, did you know, you must have noticed that I am the devil. Yes. And I'm here, what did Bill really want to say? I'm the devil and I want, I'm, I'm here to do the devil's laundry or something. He wanted, he wanted to say something very strange, but I didn't get it. Uh, that would be fun. This is the only horror film of all the films we've done. Now they're all, they're all rather twisted or odd, but this is the only truly horror film because of the cast, because of the, the uh, Kane and all the folks. Uh, the rest of them are kind of twisted psychological drama. Uh, but Rob Zombie would be great. I love, I love the, uh, yeah. <laughs> Double Three Jets, House of Thousand Corpses were great. Did you, did you recognize Bria from uh, Halloween? Yes. Okay, cool. And, and Heroes. And Heroes, that's right. She was in Heroes as well. She was fantastic. Yeah. Yes. So where did the idea for Smothered uh, come from? Ah. <laughs> I was in uh, Dusseldorf, Germany with Richard and uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, who actually was, uh, I was, I was his workout partner when he did They Live uh, at Vince's Gym in North Hollywood, California. Um, and I had never done it before. I'd never done this particular con in, uh, in Dusseldorf, in Germany before. My name is Schneider. Uh, it's not Hasselhoff, I realize that, but it is Schneider, so I had a great, I had a great show. And because I had a great show, it was only so many 20, 20 dollar euros in people's pockets, other people didn't have a great show. So we were at the bar, and uh, I was saying, Richard, so how, Richard, how's it going? He said, well, you're not good. 
I'll be lucky to make a hundred bucks in this shithole. <laughs> really? And he said, yeah, it's just, it's not, and he was helping the, the promoter run the whole show. And there was a couple of other people there. Uh, Roddy was there. And the notion came to me, well, if, if because of something Richard had said earlier, Richard told me that he actually had been hired to be Jason at somebody's, not a bar mitzvah, but somebody's at a campground. And I said, well, tell me something. If, if somebody gave you a thousand, offered you a thousand dollars right now to leave this convention and go haunt an RV park, do you think you could get five or six other horror icons to do it? And he said, you bet your ass. <laughs> and that was when Smothered was born. And we talked about different ways to, to actually, that's when that, that movie was born. But we talked about different ways to kill people. And one of the ways was because in all of the films, it's the men in the mask who invariably kill the large-breasted blonde chick in a room somewhere at an abandoned campground, that it would only be fair if the large-breasted blonde chick killed the men in the masks at an abandoned building in some campground somewhere. And by the time, that's only fair. We want to be fair. You know, smothered, now it's her turn. Or, or their turn, I'm not sure. So by the time I had flown back to, to Los Angeles at that time, I didn't live in Louisiana yet, I had written at least half of Smothered and uh, sent it to Richard and he said, oh, that's great. And we went back and forth on, on different things. I sent him draft after draft, but it was only day after day. And then he stopped responding and he stopped responding because he had passed away. And I didn't know that. And uh, a friend of mine is the one that, a uh, friend of mine and a friend of his is the one that uh, called me and said that Richard had passed. And uh, it, was, it was sad and odd. It was an odd time. And then I, I got in touch with Kane. Uh, and Kane said, let me make sure I understand this. If Richard was still alive, I wouldn't be given this opportunity. And I said, yes, that's right. He said, okay. He'd do the same for me. <laughs> and that's where that line came from. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, it's a pretty special project in, in, uh, in, in the minds of the folks who were in it, and uh, certainly in my mind. And watching some folks up here who are in the business enjoy this film really, really made me happy. And how'd you feel as fans? Did you, did you, did you feel that we dissed the fans at all, or did you, did you feel okay? You're all right with that? Oh, it's great. It was great. I can't tell you how many times people say, oh, no, dude, it's got to be blue. <laughs> Can't be authenticated unless it's blue. What the hell does that even mean? <laughs> it's gotta be blue. It's up there. There you go. It's gotta be blue. John. Yes. Question up top. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. All the way top. Yes. How many times have you seen it at this point? <laughs> oh gosh, I've seen it. Lots. Three hundred times. Yeah. <laughs> and how long since uh, you've seen it? since this screen tonight prior to your last week? What a great question. Um, <laughs> three months. Uh, and how do you feel about, um, and you're asking for questions, so instead of you know, making comments. You have to justify your questions, uh, Morgan. I'm, 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 I'm start with me. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, how, how, uh, how objective were you tonight in watching the film uh, respectful of all aspects of watching the film after three months of not seeing the film. Oh, very objective tonight. Mm -hmm. Very objective. And tonight, I actually uh, I, I bump over the nonlinear thing. It was not written as a nonlinear story. Uh, nonlinear meaning that, that those bumpers that happen, and all of a sudden you're you're in a different time. Uh, to some, to somebody who liked, somebody who didn't like that, raise their hand, not you. No, 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 I'm, I'm okay. I want to hear your perspective. No, no, it's, it, the only thing I bump over and smothered is that aspect. Uh, anybody have a problem with the nonlinear aspect? I can't say it, try to say that. Nonlinear aspect of the story. I liked it, but I have to watch it a few times. 
Well, see, as, a, as someone who wants you to watch it a few times, that's a yeah. wonderful answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a device. It's, uh, it's a puzzle. Um, when you get a jigsaw puzzle, you're given a picture and a bunch of pieces to it. And you put, them in, you put them together in whatever order you want. Most people or many people put, the, put the, uh, the border together first and then try to fill it together. Some people never look at the box cover again. You know, different ways that different people put together a puzzle. I like the nonlinear version because it, it, makes, it keeps the weight on the balls of your feet, I think, as an audience. I also think it's annoying if you're someone who wants to sit back and just enjoy a story, an interesting, fun story with good characters well told. Personally, I think the linear version is a little pedestrian and it's a little, it downplays the intelligence of the audience. This way, I think, says the horror audience is a very intellectual audience, a smart audience, and they deserve a good puzzle uh, well constructed because the pieces are all there. It works. The story is all there. It didn't it's not nonlinear because the story doesn't work and I want to confuse you. It's nonlinear because I think it's a better way to go. But I do question it. It's all if I may, it's all there personified. You have more material than you need. My question now further is not a question about linear at all. I love that it was all over the map. Um, do you do you think there's more uh, room for humor. And Anne, do you feel there's, did you see opportunities, and I saw some, um, which we can share at a later date, uh, but uh, for, for, you know, uh, literally belly laughs within uh, the insanity and the intensity of the film. And I'm speaking specifically, and I'm gonna, dare I, I'm gonna share it, just the hell with it, the dog. I think the dog and dog dogs, both, we can do some wonderful things with sound where they're just they're just quirky, crazy stuff that because they're 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 living entities and they're living this scene and I think we can integrate some more interesting stuff with the dogs. The, uh, the dog and then there, there there was the other dog too. Um, the dog and then Lucy, and the other dog who has since passed away, so we can't film yeah. anymore of Lucy. Well we can do it. Yeah, we can do it. Um, Did you have to kill Lucy? Well, what? Did you have to kill Lucy? That was the one that was sitting next to me. Well, we just re edited oh, wow. Lucy back. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's really fantastic. Um, in answer to your question, uh, within, the confines of, within the confines of film, we, we cannot film anything else. I was going to ask that. I actually preceded my question. Is the film locked? If we can't the, film, the film has been locked for a long time. So it's locked. So we the film is locked. However, if, if the distributor said this has to be a linear project, there is a linear version as well. But the linear version is cut from the locked non-linear version, which is a little bass backwards, I understand. No, that's that just me. But, um, okay. As far as sound effects go, if, if, the, if the critters could be funnier because of sound effects, yes, but as far as filming anything else, no, can't be done. I don't think no filming. I just think some, there's some sound things that could be fun, made fun, where the dogs are actually really terrible. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, oh, nice, very nice. Like that? Let's go again. Right. <laughs> like stuff like that? Yeah, well, that could be done, certainly. Certainly. But yes, uh, uh, Lucy has to be killed because I need to show the ferocity of Don Shanks. Uh, and, and oddly enough, uh, the fact that Lucy is eliminated so quickly, bam, boom, she's done. You laughed and you jumped. Well, maybe you didn't. But people, people laughed and jumped in a very uncomfortable way. It was, it was, it's interesting what happened when Lucy gets shot, just as when Mountain Man, I, I call him, uh, I forget what he's called in the script, like old fucker or something uh, in the script. But when he shoots himself in the head, that's hysterical, and I don't know why. I don't know why that's funny, but every one of you laughed when he shot himself in the head, and Ari's like, are you okay? Of course he's not okay! He shot himself in the head with a 38, he's not okay! You moron! Uh, what was the budget? Uh, this one was expensive for, very expensive for us. It was 1.2. Wow. 
$1.2 million. That's uh, I want to say, and I have no more questions for... for, for uh, Thank you very much. He was waiting. He's been waiting. He's been waiting. He found a hole. Um, beautifully shot. Beautifully edited. The DP, whoever he was, I want his name. Tom Calloway. Nice. Um, really a well shot film, and I was just wow. Wow, wow. Thank you, thank you. I watched you watch it and I enjoyed I enjoyed watching you watch it. You're going, yes! Especially especially when we were in the con world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thomas Calloway was the uh, was the DP. Uh, but I have to tell you, he put the camera where I told him to. Well, then Okay, I, I gotta tell you that. I gotta tell you that. Some beautiful, I mean really beautiful shots. I was very impressed overall with the filmmaking aspects. There, there were things I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I thought at moments I thought I'm, not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I, I don't know a genre. I don't know. I don't know whether to laugh. I don't know. I just don't know. Well, it's the point. You're not supposed to know whether to laugh or jump or cry in this particular movie, which is which is kind of cool. I mean, I like I like the notion of taking people's emotions. Uh, and pulling them left and right and center and up and down. Uh, I, I really get off in an odd way on creating something that makes people either cry at things that are really not that sad or laugh at things that are really not that funny. Uh, I'm all, all with that, and I just thought it could probably go in for a tighter edit, but... That's not going to happen, so fuck you. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh. Pardon my language, by the way, and oh. all of you who are offended by that, fuck you too. <laughs> we just saw a movie where the lady was killing herself, killing her victims with big boobs, and you're apologizing for saying fuck you. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Well, she's got to use them somehow. Just oh, to go. Sorry. Yes. Who had the question? You, sir. What do you think the market potential for the movie is? Are you, what are your plans with it from here on out? It has uh, it has distribution with a company called IndieCan right now, and that's a uh, a smaller company. Um, I was hoping that the horror fan uh, demographic, which is huge, would be exposed to this and have it be kind of a viral thing. Which could still happen on, uh, I guess, on uh, on the internet, on uh, on demand. So that's my my hope for it. Honestly, I wanted it to come out on December thirteenth, two years ago, uh, Friday the thirteenth, December thirteenth, and and uh, sweep the horror world by storm for about two week two weeks and make a bunch of money, uh, and have people people say, "Wow, what else do you have?" That did not happen, uh, but it still it still could in an odd way because since then, uh, on demand has become a huge, actually bigger. Alicia and I were in California just a uh, week before last, and all 20th Century Fox is talking about, all Universal is talking about, all the Weinstein Company is talking about, all uh, Lionsgate. Uh, Lionsgate. Thank you, Lionsgate is talking about is on demand. So. Um, there was a thought 15 years ago that theatrical release was really something that, that uh, was a tool that studios were willing to lose money on in order to feed uh, DVD release. And now it's the same thing with On Demand. Personally, I think this film with On Demand is one of those things that horror fans will say to other fans, dude, you, you gotta see this thing. Yeah. This, thing is, this thing is so cool. Oh, I've never seen now. Kane Hodder like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's so. This still could be the sleeper film in a brand new medium, on demand. Uh, that is the paranormal activity kind of film, which which just bored the shit out of me for about an hour and fifteen minutes. I thought, when is this movie gonna start? When am I gonna see what I saw in the trailer? And then I did, and it was like, okay, thank you. That's great. That scene is great. I saw it in the trailer. Why have I come here? 
Sorry, it's just, and I know they made a billion dollars. I understand. I'm not like, and then God bless them for doing that. It was incredible marketing. Was it an incredible movie? No, it was not the Blair Witch Project, which I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the Blair Witch Project. Uh, a very intellectual piece of odd, new suspense. I wouldn't call it horror, but suspense. And it worked for me as, a, as a, an audi audience member. It worked for me really well. Paranormal Activity, the trailer worked great. <laughs> the rest of it, not so much. John. Yes, what? Yes. Uh, Bang! John. Oh, John. Oh, uh, <laughs> Yes, sir. Two questions. Oh, well, before I have two questions, oh, I'd just like to say two questions. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. you Much appreciated. It. Um, it's wacky and wild and out there somewhere. I'm not quite sure where, but I'm sure that someone will discover it sooner or later. Uh, where it's from. <laughs> the two questions. When do we get to see the movie and where can I buy the boobs? <laughs> Where can you buy the boobs? You can rent them. Where can you rent the boobs? You have to come to the studio in Louisiana. Uh, we have them in the screening room. Yeah, but what are they out there? Dude, that they're for sale? Jeez. Well, on eBay. You have to buy the boobs on eBay. Actually, you make, make a lot of money on that. You, make, you know, you're right. Well, I have the boobs. I have the boobs uh, on my nightstand. <laughs> And I know that I have them because I check to make sure they're there every night. No, that's not true. The movies, the, the boobs are in the screening room uh, at John Schneider Studios. They're there so that when people come in, they go, huh. <laughs> and then we go and watch some other film. An icebreaker. An icebreaker. This is an icebreaker. It's a boot breaker. Um, <laughs> the first question was, when will we be able to see the movie? Well, we just did. No, um, February, Indican is, uh, is putting the film out uh, on demand, and I'm excited about that. There will be some special features. There will be the linear version of it as well, so if you do buy the DVD, uh, you can see the linear version, uh, and then you can make up your own mind, which maybe we'll do a contest or something. Uh, there are two other scripts that are out there. Uh, because I'm odd, Smothered is the second script, Suffered is the first script, and Striker is the third script. So Suffered is the story of how Dee Dee became the girl that she was, as you heard her say, uh, remember when Daddy used to massage me? He massaged me a couple times a week, I know, because I saw you see him do that. That's a big part of the first script, because why is this girl doing this stuff to these people who wear the masks. So, uh, should Smothered do well, there will be a Suffered, and then there will be a story of how Kane becomes Striper, which is the new guy at the front table that pushes the old guy, and Michael Berryman, who was wonderful to work with, pushes us back to the table near the restroom. John, are you seeing somebody? <laughs> no, but I hear voices. <laughs> <laughs> These are, this one's not nearly, this is, I tell you what's so funny, I think is funny, is Smothered is the least twisted film that we've done. Uh, again, John, are you seeing somebody? <laughs> no, but I'm hearing voices. <laughs> well, we'll deal with that tomorrow. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of them, yes. How did Christine make its way into the movie? How did my witch? How did Christine make it into the movie? Oh, good question. Uh, Malcolm Danar was in Christine. Malcolm Danar played Moochie Wells, who was cut in half by Christine. Mm -hmm. And I said to Malcolm, uh, actually, and I have to tell you a little story about that. Malcolm got in the movie because Sid Haig was offered the movie and he didn't read it in time. And I'm pretty much of a prick. And when I send somebody a script and say, we are shooting this thing in two weeks, I need to know by Monday at noon whether you want to do it. Monday at noon 01, I offer it to somebody else. And Sid was at a show and Sid didn't get a chance to read it. And that's understandable. Sid's a great guy. But at 12.01 on Monday, I offered it to Malcolm. Malcolm was supposed to originally be the guy with a big scar. 
which is why the guy with the big scar's name is Ranger Mucci. It says Mucci on his name tag. So, so here's the story, actor folks and producer, well, actually, just actor folks. It's easier to change actors than it is to change name tags. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can I get an amen from the actors in the room? Yeah. Yes. So when Sid didn't answer, I called Malcolm and I said, would you be Sid, now Malcolm? And he said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. And I said, what can we do to the script to change it to fit it more to you? And he said, I know a guy in Florida that has the original or the, the, uh, the car that cut me in half in the movie. I said, get in touch with him and we'll put that car in the movie if he'll do it and we'll have you do that role. So I rewrote it for Malcolm, the guy that was in It beckons, it beckons Tarantino. It's right on it. Oh, thank you. You know, the, the odd thing is that the, uh, I did a, a something with Quentin about two years ago. I, well, we did Mardi Gras with Quentin two years ago, Quentin Tarantino. And he reminded me that one of the only places he felt at home, uh, the only people that did not kick him off the set because he wanted to soak in as much Hollywood and as much movie making as he possibly could when he was a child, uh, he climbed over the fence at Warner Brothers and spent time on the Dukes of Hazard set because he was an actor student of Jimmy Best. <laughs> he made that up, I swear. No, I did not make that up. I did not make that up. And, and uh, he said we were the only people that were kind to him and didn't kick him, didn't kick him out. Yeah. Then he offered me a role to a movie he's already done and he never called me since then. What movie? It's something about a bunch of people in a, in a, in a it hasn't out yet. It's not out yet. There's some movie where they're in a, in a, uh, they're snowbound in a building somewhere. It's like a western, like, uh, like Will Penny during the winter times with uh, Charlton Heston. Yes, Das Boot in a, in a, uh, in a cabin. Yes. Speaking of James Best, did you guys ever make Killer Shrews too? <laughs> Do we make Killer Shrews too? Yeah. Well, you could say that Jimmy's movie, Return of the Killer Shrews, was actually Killer Shrews too. We did not make Killer Shrews three. Because again, it's hard for dead people to show up. Yeah. That's really awful of me to say. But you know, you're a little insight into my heart. Now, Jimmy did it was in uh, Killer Shrews back in the 50s. Yeah. And he owned the title and made a movie called uh, Return of the Killer Shrews. Uh, and I was in it, and Rick Hurst was in it, and Jimmy was in it. And it was uh, actually quite delightful and quite campy. and, and uh, a fun movie. It was, it was as much fun as Sharknado. I mean, come on. <laughs> What's that? Four years ago? Yeah, that's what I was wondering about. Because I was following, I was following it on Facebook for a while. Oh well, get get it. I signed a couple copies of it today. It's very funny. I'll look for it. I play a, I play a guy Johnny Re Remo. Rico. Johnny Reno. Reno, who's a talk a, a, a my God, really Johnny Reno. He's a reality show. Phenomenon, and, and uh, I do everything from Chris, Christopher Walken to uh, to our wonderful guy who we lost. Uh, well, that little bugger, um, Steve Irwin. Uh, Irwin, yes, yes, who I loved. I loved uh, Crocodile Hunter. What, what it's called Return of the Killer Shrews. Yeah, check it out. It's fun. It's a fun movie. Yes. I just wanted to double check. Um, <clears throat> On the boobs, I'm still thinking of the boobs. Are, are we back to the boobs? It's always about the boobs. Did you ever try them on? And if so, do you have pictures? <laughs> you did. I did not try them on because they were fit especially for Bria. But I did, I did get to okay them. Uh, and, and the, uh, the criteria was that they had to be visible from, the, from behind. Uh, there was a character in Playboy magazine called Little Annie Fanny. And I, I, the people that made them are CFX in, uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They also made the leg. Uh, they made the hand that the ants had eaten. And by the way, the visual effects here were not visual effects. Uh, the ants were visual effects. But all of the other stuff was actual, real, practical effects. 
Uh, I'm not a big fan of visual effects. If you can't actually do it, then I don't think it should be done. Uh, that comes from my Dukes of Hazard days. If you can't get in a car and jump 187 feet, then you shouldn't do it. Uh, and I think you can tell as an audience. You can tell when something is really being done. Um, so I, I, uh, I went back three times to make sure that the, the uh, breasts were the right volume and diameter. Uh, and apparently it was, because we shot this film in July in Louisiana. And, uh, and Bria, it's basically like wearing a wetsuit. And it was, it was miserable for her. It was really not, not great for her. But she had to be fitted with them because she had to fit inside them properly. They, or, or it wouldn't fit right. Right? It's like a life mask. Uh, it, you have to take a, a, a model of someone's face before you start putting all that, like on cane, before all that stuff was on there. They had to take a, a model of his face in order to do that so it would fit properly. Well, same thing with Bria. And she was a, a great trooper. She was wonderful. I mean, she had to stand there and get plastered and, and molds and opposite molds. Or it, it's like making a bronze. Uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. Uh, and I do have them. Do I get that job in the next one? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you can, you can, if you come and do, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to do Painless. I, I believe we're going to do a movie called Painless in December. And uh, you, can, you can sleep with them if you sleep in the screening room. I'm not letting you have them in your room. Actually, they great I was thinking about it, inserting like speakers, little, little like earbuds. No. Oh my god. The have was online, yes, yes. And they're called. That's my voice in there doing that. Okay, that's about enough of that. Anyone have any, any other questions? Oh my god, where have I gone? Wait. Yes. They're right back. Yes. Um, one question I had for you was. Uh, I knew that because you raised your hand. <laughs> I'm sorry. When, when you uh, do your movies and different things, um, how do you actually uh, pick your different actors? Um, I'm I'm a because I'm a guy who has gone to through the embarrassed. It's it's interesting because I'm a guy who's been a celebrity in the '80s and gone through the embarrassing process of auditioning for people who were in diapers when they watched my show. <laughs> and I basically would like to string them up and let and put peanut butter on them and let ants eat their soul. <laughs> I call people who are friends of mine who I think are right, because I write these things as well. So I call people and say, hey, read this and let me know if you want to do it. Uh, and then that leads to more films. Uh, Don Shanks, who was in this film, uh, did a movie for Alicia and I called Like Son. He played the lead in that. While he was doing Smothered, I gave him the script of Like Son, and he read it and he said, I tell you what, whoever plays this character is, whoever plays Frank, this is a great role. And I said, what are you talking about? I want you to be Frank. And he was beside himself. He did go on to be Frank. He did a wonderful, wonderful job. Dane, who was Randy in this film, has been in everything that we've done since this film. Because he's that good. So I, I, I enjoy, I, I prayed for someone to call me and say, would you be this character in this role? Which happened with Killer Shrews. And those are the phone calls I like to do. Now, roles that, that uh, other roles that people, people come in and people I don't know, sure, they'll read. And we'll see, we'll see if they're right for it. But leads of films invariably are people who have shown that they have the stuff uh, in prior films for me. And maybe that's weird. It may be what... Uh, 
Burt Reynolds did that. And it started to get kind of campy. Uh, and I'm hoping that's not what we're doing. I think that Dane Rhodes is every bit as good as Russell Crowe has ever been. And I, I'm, I think that uh, Maddie Nichols, who you haven't seen yet, when you see Anderson Bench, when you see Like Son, when you see uh, Inadmissible, you'll go, who the hell is that girl? She's amazing. These are people that came out of this rather odd, I guess, process. Um, so I don't just cast people who are friends. I cast people who are right for the part. And if they're friends of mine, they get the part. Not because they're friends of mine, but because they're right. I don't give them the script unless they're right. And then the other, the other characters, for example, uh, where I met Alicia, we did a film uh, called Hate Crime. And it was a guy that had a very big role in the film called Hate Crime. He wound up in Like Son. He then wound up as an ancillary character. And after that, he wound up as a character called Anderson Bench in a film called Anderson Bench <laughs> because he was that good. So that's how it works for me. How did you get into the have and have nots? <laughs> I think kind of the same way, except uh, Tyler, Tyler Perry, uh, had a, a list of people that I believe he was aware of. I mean, I know he's aware of, he was a Dukes fan, but I know I, I came and read for that with about maybe five other people. Um, <laughs> and the hurdle for the hurdle for me with, with haves and have nots, uh, oddly enough, now that you've seen me here and you've seen that, uh, <coughs> It's hard for, for people who just see my on-screen persona to believe I'm that big of an asshole. And it, I don't know if you've seen haves and have-nots or not, but I'm a bad man. Pardon my language, I apologize. Uh, I'm a bad man in, in uh, the haves and have-nots. And I think I needed to prove that to Tyler. I really do. <laughs> and I have proven that. <laughs> I say to him sometimes, this boy, because he, he writes it. I say, this is just, this is awful. He said, well, you're bringing it to life. I said, you wrote it. He said, you're bringing it to life. Well, you wrote it. Well, you're bringing it to life. It's an interesting conversation we have. Yes? What did you like to be best? Horror? Uh, funny stuff? Boots and hazard stuff? I mean, what is your favorite? I like to make people think. I like to make people feel. I like to make people uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> which makes you explore what's going on in your mind. Um, I like entertainment to be visceral. I like, to be, I like it to be something that makes you go, ooh. I, wa I want you to want to wash your hands after you've seen a film. I really do. Uh, those are the kind of films that I enjoy. Um, I hate walking out of a film and having somebody say, hey, how was that? Meh. 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 M-E-H. Yeah. Hate that. I'd rather have somebody say, that was the worst, that was the most offensive, awful, terrible thing I've ever seen. I'd rather have them say that than, meh. Yeah. I want people to feel something. Uh, <laughs> kind of like I'm feeling now. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's important. I think uh, movies are not just uh, uh, a means by which to sell popcorn and cold drinks. I think movies are, are the reason you go. Uh, the popcorn and cold drinks, pardon me, theater owners, are the ancillary uh, parts of what's going on here. You're supposed to go. You're supposed to see heroes. You're supposed to see anti-heroes. You're supposed to be people you want to be like. You're supposed to be people you don't want to be like. You're supposed to see situations you'd love to be in and, and situations that you hope you can avoid. That's what I think is supposed to happen up here. That's what happened to me when I was a kid sitting in that row. That's the row I sat in all the time. I don't know how that could be because that would hurt my neck right now. And by the way, this is a beautiful theater. Beautiful, beautiful theater. Yes.
I know that song. Okay, I can name that song. And okay, uh, two more questions, then we gotta go because it's late and we have to start early tomorrow. Yes, sir. With a budget of 1.2, if yes. you had if you had a bigger budget, would there be something you would have changed? Uh, if I had a bigger budget, would there be something I would have changed? Um, Made you no, think. I don't think so. I don't think so. And that, for me, that's a huge budget. What? The movies we're, we're making, we've made since then, are under half a million dollars. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think. I think. I think a lot of money actually spoils spoils what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, there's a certain there's a certain art. There's a certain magic in desperation of we're running out of money. Uh, I think about people who say, well, okay, we'll just do that again. And they're talking about, I mean, I, this comes from, I, I think, when I was auditioning for Dukes of Hazard, they were shooting a movie called 1941 at Warner Brothers. Steven Spielberg was shooting 1941. Thousand extras, 1,000 extras. A huge, silly looking thing that was part of a roller coaster that was supposed to make a Japanese zero, who knows how much that cost, roll down and, and come off the end of it and uh, land in a movie theater in a marquee. I have not seen 1941, okay, but I know it did not do well. Uh, I was there the first time they did that, and the word was, this is 1978, that this was a million dollar shot. One million dollar roll of the camera, or cameras, I'm sure they had 15 or 20 cameras. But what was about to happen that would take about 15 seconds was a million dollars. And that plane came off and fell right off the end of that thing and landed in the street and kind of <laughs> skidded to the front of the movie. Didn't work, the shot didn't work. They had to do it again later. Another million dollars or more because I had to make it work. I don't know. I think I think that that kind of money or that kind of power corrupts. Mm -hmm. I really do. Uh, something I know for a fact because I've seen I've seen so many documentaries on it. Uh, Jaws is an amazing movie. You'll still you can put Jaws on right now. Jaws will work, but Jaws is what it is because the shark didn't work. The genius of Steven Spielberg, from what I understand is how to still make a movie on a budget when the number one thing you were counting on, which was the shark working, was not working. So he had to come up with other stuff because there wasn't anybody to give him another million dollars or another hundred thousand dollars or another ten dollars or another two dollars or one dollar for a cup of coffee when he made that movie and it's brilliant. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change Smothered. Uh, I wouldn't change Like Sun. I wouldn't change Anderson Bench. Uh, I wouldn't change Inadmissible. Not a bit. They're out there. They are what they are. And let's see what people think. Okay. One more. Oh my God! <laughs> one more, or that's it, or maybe that was it. Yes, one more, and then we're going. Yes, what are, sir. What other upcoming films do you have that you'd like to tell us about? Upcoming films, uh, uh, there's a wonderful movie uh, that I was in where I met Alicia, there's Alicia right there, that is called Hate Crime, uh, that is a, a story of two families uh, on the eve of one family's son's execution by the state for having murdered the other family's son. Uh, I played the other family's, the father of the, of the son who was murdered. Uh, Laura Calluette, who was in uh, Django Unchained and a, and a bunch of Tarantino films, a bunch of films, plays my wife. Um, and it's, it's quite thought-provoking. It's, it's a wonderful film about a very 
short period of time, if you Google search hate crime, you'll see uh, you'll see a lot of stuff about that coming up right now. Uh, then there's one we did called Like Sun, which is with Don Shanks, who was just in this one, uh, where there's been some some terrible things happen to a young girl. A young girl is is found. Uh, raped and, and she's 12, she's raped and murdered and shoved underneath a diesel tank at somebody's farm. And uh, there's a father who is the sheriff and a son who is the deputy sheriff who both suspect each other of the crime. And it's, it's, uh, it's pretty intense. Uh, Don does a wonderful job in that and uh, it's, it's pretty great. Then we did one called Anderson Bench, which is a very odd, twisted, love story uh, where uh, uh, a young, a guy who's having a really pretty terrible life, kind of kind of like having, a, this, these folks had a terrible convention, well this guy's had a terrible life, and his, his thought is if I could have just one good day in a row, I could die a happy man. And he meets a woman, a uh, young girl, who, uh, who makes that happen. So in answer to the question of, uh, if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt you were living the best day of your life, not only the best day you've ever had, but the best day you will ever have, how would you end that day? Uh, it's odd, odd, delightfully odd film. Sounds interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, so look up Anderson Bench and uh, see what shows up. And then we just did one uh, that was originally called Bad Blood that's now called Inadmissible because there was a film last year apparently called Bad Blood. But we're too busy making movies to go see them. <laughs> yeah. Yes! <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, again, an, an odd story, a twisted, not twisted, it's, it's what, what would happen if you were a prosecutor who didn't care whether somebody was guilty or innocent, you prosecuted them with every every bone in your body, every fiber in your being. Uh, just as a defender is supposed to do the opposite, right? right. Supposed to defend people whether they're innocent or guilty. Uh, and you discovered, I mean, that, you didn't just do it, but you loved it. You loved getting people the death sentence. You loved it. And then you, and you're, and you're raising your daughter. And you're trying to raise a daughter who is not a bad person, but you know you're a bad person. And then you find out that your parents were really terrible people. Uh, before you were born, your parents were worse than Bonnie and Clyde. And uh, what do you do with that information? And that's what this, that's what this film is about. So uh, there's no unicorns or puffy clouds or or puppy dogs in any of them. They are, as I said, films that will make you think, films that will make you uncomfortable, films that will make you wonder, uh, and hopefully uh, films that will cause great uh, difficult conversation in the car on the way home. So that's, that's what uh, JSS, John Schneider Studios, and Maven which is Alicia, that's what, uh, that's what uh, our films are all about. So uh, if you're into that, you're going to really enjoy them. If you're not, you are going to, you, you're not going to like them at all. And that's okay. That's okay. Uh, but when you see them, when you, when you see an ad for Anderson Bench, or Hate Crime, or Like Sun, or Inadmissible, please give it, well, you're here, so I have a feeling you may, you may actually enjoy them. You may enjoy them a lot. Uh, and I guarantee you, I promise you, that the movies that come after that will be also thought-provoking and rather uncomfortable. But hey, that for me is what entertainment is about. It's not mindless, not mindless stuff. I thought Toy, Toy Story was uncomfortable and entertaining. I really did. It wasn't just mindless, mindless stuff. I mean, it, it made me wonder about throwing friendship away. It really did. So. Uh, and up, up made me very uncomfortable. Uh, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, excellent. So are you Tarantino and Rob Zombie going to do a show? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We have to all rewrite each other's material. That would be 
That would be awesome. That would be awesome. I don't know. That would be that would be a lot of fun. Yes. Uh, my goal is to have uh, uh, Robert Redford and uh, let's see who would you get? I get I get Jack Nicholson. I get Jack Nicholson, Robert Redford, Gene Wilder. Uh, uh, my favorite, who is really having a tough time right now, which is uh, which is uh, oh my gosh, Dick Van Dyke mm -hmm. and Ed Asner. Uh, yet a, a bunch of folks who who really are incredible, incredible actors together and have them in one movie yeah. at the same time. Uh, you have to do it. Well, I want to, and, and I wanted Charles Durning, and Charles Durning passed away. Uh, there's several people I, I, I just, I, I, I've got this thing about, about going out with a bang. You know, I mean, we're all going to go out at some time, we're all going to have our last cup of coffee. We just don't know that's what it was, right? So I'm, I'm, we have a film that one of these days we're gonna do that's, that's about that, and my hope is that the people who I, I really love and adore, as far as a fan, uh, will still be around to be in it. Uh, and that's called Useful People, so put that in the back of your head. Uh, useful People, if you ever hear about a film called Useful People, please go out and give it a shot. Uh, yeah, Tyler. Okay. And, oh yeah, absolutely. Tyler's been great. This is where I showed uh, where I showed Collier and Company uh, at the Carmike Cinema down the road, and, and uh, yeah, Tyler's been great. Been great. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it. It's late. <laughs> you want your makeup? You want your makeup? Okay, cool. Cool, cool. I want to make sure you like the makeup. That's what the matters. The first thing I asked her, I was like, I wonder if those boobs are fake or... <laughs> They're really that good was, fakes. That was my first question. They're really good fakes. <laughs> so thank you folks for...